when main sequence stars reach the end of their lives, they don't just fizzle out and die quietly. The end of a main sequence star's life might actually be the most interesting phase. Today, we'll be looking at giants and supergiants. When a star with the mass of our sun, for example, yellow dwarves, die, they first become giant stars. Our sun, for example, will become a red giant. Giant stars have radii 10 to thousands of times greater than that of our sun and a much higher luminosity. Large and luminous main sequence stars are not called giants. They are called dwarf stars, no matter how large or luminous they are. A star is only considered to be a giant after it depletes all of its hydrogen. Stars with about 0.25 solar masses will not reach the giant phase due to not being dense enough to fuse helium. If you remember the last two parts of our series, we established that main sequence stars must fuse hydrogen into helium to be considered main sequence. Well, giant stars must be able to fuse helium into heavier elements in order to be considered giants. When a star around the same mass as our sun expends its hydrogen supplies, the core begins to contract due to gravity and the outer layers expand and become cooler, which is why the sun will go from being hot white to a much cooler red colour. The mass of such a star would stay the same. The only thing that changes is the diameter and the luminosity increasing. The solar mass star will then experience something called a helium flash. This is when the core gets so hot due to degenerate pressure that helium fusion is initiated and the star briefly produces as much energy as the entire Milky Way galaxy. This only lasts a few minutes and causes the star's core to expand rapidly. These solar mass stars will remain red giants for only a few million to billion years, fusing helium into carbon via the triple alpha process until it runs out of helium. As this happens, the outer layers of the star drift off into space, forming a planetary nebula, and leaving a small dead core of the star behind, also known as a white dwarf, not to be confused with main sequence dwarf stars, of course, as a white dwarf has left the main sequence a long time ago. A famous example of a red giant star would be Omicron Ceti or Mira. The stars change in luminosity and diameter constantly, which can also be described as pulsating. When the largest and most massive main sequence stars reach the end of their lives, they end up as supergiants and hypergiants. These supergiants can have very low surface temperatures, ranging from 2500 Kelvin to very high surface temperatures of 20,000 Kelvin. But one characteristic remains consistent and that is their extremely large mass and size. This all begins when massive main sequence stars die, and unlike our sun, there will be no helium flash. Instead, the stars will smoothly initiate helium fusion before degeneracy pressure becomes prevalent. Some of these stars can grow to 150 solar masses. When the supergiant star runs out of helium, unlike the giant star, they will continue the process of fusion because of how dense they are. After the helium is fused into carbon, the carbon is then fused into heavier elements such as neon, sodium and magnesium. This is how heavy elements are created in the cores of stars. 
In a way, without these stars, there would be no planets, no rocks, no solids, nothing but hydrogen and helium. After this, in stars with more than 12 solar masses, the neon is fused into oxygen, and the oxygen into silicon, and eventually iron. These supergiant stars only live for a few hundred million years. However, the fusion of carbon to iron will only take a few hundred years. After the core is mostly iron, no further fusion can occur. Once the star surpasses the Chandrasekhar limit, the outer layers of the star, no longer supported by fusion, begin to fall inwards, towards the core. The core gets denser and denser as this happens, and the outer layers of the star then rebound off the core and are ejected back into space, forming a supernova. The densities and the heat reached at the core in this time period is responsible for the creation of heavier than iron elements such as uranium. A supernova will produce more energy than all of the energy our sun has produced in its 10 billion year lifespan, and it will shine brighter than 10 billion suns. Left behind where the core once stood, a neutron star will have taken its place. If the star was massive enough, instead of a neutron star, a void will be left behind, a tear in space and time, also known as a black hole. I'll go into more detail about neutron stars and black holes in my next star classification video, but we'll stick to the topic of giants and supergiants for now. This supernova I just described now is known as a type 2 supernova. A type 1 supernova usually involves two white dwarf stars orbiting each other in a binary system, with the gas from one star triggering a supernova event in the other but we'll leave that out for now to avoid too much confusion. A very well known example of a supergiant star is Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse was once a massive main sequence star, just one million years ago. Now it's a red hot supergiant star. It's only around 8 million years old, which is nothing compared to the lower mass stars like our sun, currently sitting at 4.6 billion years of age. Now, you may have noticed that I haven't yet mentioned hypergiants. This is because their life cycles aren't really that much different to a supergiant. A hypergiant is essentially a higher luminosity supergiant star that undergoes a high amount of mass loss due to its intense stellar winds. A hypergiant isn't a set in stone star type, however. Any massive supergiant can phase in and out of being a hypergiant. A main sequence star may phase straight into the hypergiant phase, for example, and then as it loses mass, it becomes a supergiant. Hypergiants are usually bright blue in colour, However, there have been some cooler surface temperatures in hypergiants that may be yellow, white or red in colour. A famous example of a hypergiant would be UI Scuddy, currently considered to be the largest star in the observable universe. However, the stars can't hold their massive size and luminosity for too long, and UI Scuddy constantly pulsates out of its tidal of being the largest star. One thing to remember about supergiants and hypergiants however, is that their mass isn't necessarily that large. They are luminous and they are large, but UI Scotty, the largest star in the Milky Way, is only 30 times as massive as our nearest star. Now, the most massive known star is r 13 a one very creative, I know. This star is bright blue, unlike UI Scotty, which is red or orange in colour. The most massive hypergiant in the Milky Way, however, is Pistol Star, which is also bright blue, and therefore 
very, very hot. Now you really have to be careful when you describe a star's size by its mass versus describing it by its diameter and luminosity. And it could be very confusing when you look up the most massive star in the universe and then you accidentally change the wording and look up the largest star in the universe and you get two completely contradictory results. And that is the end of this video. I'd uh, stick around for the next part, which will be covering black holes and neutron stars and all of those other extremophile stars out there. That should be interesting. I'd ask you to subscribe to my second channel, but even more importantly, subscribing to my main channel. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe. You better subscribe.